Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Uplifting Impact podcast. I'm Justin Ponder with Uplifting Impact, and I'm excited to be hosting you today as we dive deeper into our journey to make the world more diverse, equitable, and inclusive. Today, we're very excited to be talking with Adrian Lawrence. As Vice President and Senior Consultant for Jennifer Brown Consulting, Adrian successfully educates executives and personnel across industries on matters concerning professional development, strategic organizational growth, and inclusive leadership. When she's not elevating conversations on professional development and inclusion, she guests lectures and speaks at colleges and universities in the United States and abroad, such as UC Berkeley, Stanford Law School, and London School of Economics and Political Science. Her book, Staying in the Game, the playbook for beating workplace sexual harassment, earned Axiom's 2021 Business Book of the Year Award in the Women and Minorities in Business category. Adrian, welcome to our show. Thank you, Justin. appreciate being here. So we'll start off with a quick icebreaker just so our audience can get to know a little bit more about you. So this one's coming a little far off. If you were a character in a video game, what would be your special ability? <laughs> it's funny in particular that you say video game. I probably have the abilities of like Spider-Man. It seems kind of fun just going from building to building. Ah, so is there something about, what is it about particular about swinging from building to building that's so attractive to you? Well, it's an easy way to commute if you're in New York City. That's the way it seems Spider-Man gets away with a lot of things. <laughs> easy transport. And what about the Spidey sense? Being able to perceive things before they happen? Oh, goodness. Uh, it's probably something I don't necessarily want at this point. <laughs> uh, but, but it's all right. The ease and access of commute. I'll take that. Fantastic. So yeah, and all the things that you're doing that we read about just in your bio, I imagine ease for being able to transfer between all these different worlds is very important. And I know we've talked a little bit, but can you share with our audience a little bit more about you, who you are, your DEI journey, and all the buildings you have to swing between? <laughs> well, I, I feel like the buildings in this kind of metaphor could represent the different roles I seem to undertake. I am a vice president and also a senior consultant at Jennifer Brown Consulting, where we focus on creating workplace where every employee can feel welcome, valued, respected, and heard. And through that opportunity, I connect with a lot of clients, individuals, professionals, executives, whether it's learning and development, strategic work in terms of reaching DEI goals, and especially with DEI being such a hot button issue, yet also being such a lucrative source of joy for workplaces and businesses altogether. It's very interesting being in this field right now. Uh, and in addition to being in the DEI space, I'm also a lecturer, an uh, ethnic professor at USC, where I talk about media law. And it kind of works out since I spend a fair amount of my time also with my foot in the media arena, giving legal analysis, as well as commenting on racial and social justice issues in society. I encourage all of our listeners to go and look for a lot of those things that they'll learn a lot and I hope they enjoy them as much as I do. So thank you for your insights there. But if you had to kind of summarize maybe some areas of interest for you, those intersections between law and media and social justice, what are some things that are attracting your attention now? And you mentioned about foregrounding the ways in which this work brings a lot of joy into workplaces. So I guess combining it, what is bringing you joy and really resonating with you about what you're learning and combining from legal analysis, media, and social justice? Oh, wow. So that's a compound question. So a lot <laughs> Sorry, going on there. Yeah. Um, I can tell you what I've kept my eye on. It doesn't necessarily bring me joy, unfortunately, although uh, challenging moments, uh, you can grow from them. Seeing how our society is attacking DEI or abandoning it, especially without people having a really good foundational understanding of what DEI is, diversity, equity, inclusion impacts us all. Just because you may not have a richly melanated skin doesn't mean that you are not diverse or not that you need equity or you not need to be included, whether it's neurodivergence, it's an invisible disability, if it's just a difference, if you have veteran status, or maybe you have certain religious beliefs, if you are Mormon, and thus maybe you subscribe to not drinking caffeine and whatnot. And to be able to go to an event where you can connect with your colleagues, where alcohol is not always pushed in your face, 
creating work environments that are welcoming for everybody and being more understanding of the fact that people are different and figuring out ways in which you can level the playing field. That is where people are able to achieve optimal performance, where businesses truly can thrive, where the human capital in which they invest are able to do their best and to be their best. And so when people get more of a richer, truer, and I guess more accurate understanding of what it is, then they're rooting for it. But otherwise, I'm watching a lot in the political arena how it's being weaponized to the detriment of not only just individual businesses, but our probably GDP as a nation at the end of the day. So like some of the protections that have historically kept those things in place, the erosion of kind of those protections that you've been talking about has been like the Civil Rights Act. And it's been a cornerstone in addressing workplace discrimination. And I'm interested in your legal analysis about how effective has it been specifically in tackling issues related to harassment? Oh, I can tell you. Uh, It's great in theory, but when it comes to true practice and enforcement, uh, the courts have by and large, they haven't interpreted it such that it's so difficult to win, whether the case is any form of sex, gender discrimination, workplace harassment, bullying, whatever the reason is that impacts the protected identity. The courts have made the bar so high and also the employer's kind of duties so low that it makes it such that these toxic behaviors that can ruin people's lives and interfere with their ability to earn a livelihood, their economic independence, that they are put in a situation where oftentimes they stay in that situation, no matter how toxic it may be, because of the limits that have been created by the courts largely. That's a big problem. But then again, we're not seeing big change at all from Congress whether it's changing the cap for compensatory and punitive damage or compensatory, I should say, damages at the federal level. It's our society, the mentality and the way in which we look at workplaces. It's not necessarily something to be proud of. So what areas do you feel need further refinement? So you mentioned something about refinement around compensatory damages and those areas and having more protections for the individuals rather than making that standard for employers so low. What are some other areas that would make these protections more effective? By and large, creating a higher bar for employers in terms of needing to comply with showing that they created an environment that is welcoming, that isn't necessarily one in which puts forward an environment that is toxic, that is hostile in some way. Uh, also, a lot of employers, get they get to write off as a business expense their legal fee also what they have insurance that'll take care of a lot of it. The thing that they generally fear the most is the negative PR, because that means that consumers are going to be less likely to continue to do business with them. And they don't fear lawsuits with the courts simply because getting a large verdict or even getting one that would in any way make you rethink your business practices, it's rarely the case. But where they can be hit by the pockets are the things that go on in the press and the media. And it shouldn't necessarily be that. And so that's kind of mentioning possible negative deterrent for employers to, hey, you're going to suffer in the market. But the negative consequences for whistleblowers are always much steeper. And, you know, they play such a significant and crucial role in exposing workplace misconduct. But what legal protections exist for them for coming forward and reporting harassment? And how could those protections improve? Well, the thing is, is it kind of almost depends what industry you're in. If it's just every day, then there aren't really much protections. You know, you do have the law that says that retaliation is wrong and that the employer can be held liable for it. But again, when you have the bar so high and also you have verdicts generally being so low, if not facing arbitration agreements that force you out of the public spotlight in terms of what goes on in courts you know, you're going to be in situations where employers will not necessarily do much because you don't have that safeguards protecting the whistleblower. But also, again, it may depend on industry because when it comes to financials, our Congress has put measures into play where that person, sometimes you can even get a reward for reporting your company. And so it really just shows you what we truly value. And it's not necessarily the everyday worker just trying to make their living. And how do regulatory agencies such as EEOC play a role in enforcing workplace harassment laws and what can be done to enhance those? So for some of our listeners who might not know about these things, 
and some of our listeners who might be experiencing these things, what are some of the agencies that they can turn to? What are some of the limitations, but also some of the areas for enhancing their effectiveness as you see it? Yeah, that's well, those are very, very big questions. Yeah. Uh, in part, I will say that organizations like the EEOC, which is on the federal level, and then most states also have their own state branch that deals with issues of employment and equal opportunity. The thing is, they're agencies, they're inundated. Have we ever been? Have you ever run to the DMV? Like they can barely see you without an hour, two hour wait, so to speak. And it's the same thing with a lot of other agencies. They have so many cases coming through. And so many complaints and whatnot that they can't, they can't do it on their own, which is oftentimes why individuals will have to have private lawsuits, but also retaining an attorney, being fearful of how much they're going to pay if they're not on a contingency fee agreement. There are just so many things that make it difficult for these agencies to provide the guidance and to lend the assistance that it had envisioned that they would be able to. Um, but I also think that's a reflection of the fact that our society doesn't necessarily value the experience of the worker. And so it's the thought that a lot of people aren't going to come forward. Or if they do, they'll just let it go, even though we still have these inundated agencies, because it tells you that even the smaller number of people that actually report and say something, it's still a large number of people. And so you kind of mentioned how intimidating it can be for people to bring legal action against perpetrators, and even if they do, how long it can take. In your experience being immersed in this world and being so involved with it and helping so many people, what things have you found to be valuable and available for people who are working through this experience of workplace harassment while in, in addition to the legal actions and maybe instead of or while they're waiting on legal action? Well, uh, that again, is a big question because there are so many different avenues that are particularly to you. And that's why I wrote my book, Staying in the Game, the playbook for beating workplace sexual harassment. It's because I wanted people to be fully informed. When I went through my situation with a former employer, I would have loved to have known not just what my legal options were because I was a lawyer, but also the sociological options. How can I navigate this without having to sue, without having to call an attorney? How do I best deal with this person? who is bullying me, basically, who's trying to get me to play small in some way by using my gender, using gender expectations or any kind of sex basis. I wanted to have those answers. And so the thing is, it's unique to each and every person. And that's what I focus on in staying in the game is providing you with all of the tools so you can navigate it and do it in a way that works in your best interest. Thank you for that answer. And thank you also for mentioning Staying in the Game, the playbook for beating workplace sexual harassment. Can You mentioned it. Can you tell us a little bit more about the book? For example, what inspired you to write it? Yeah. When it came to writing Staying in the Game, I wanted something that wasn't a memoir that talked about someone's life, that wasn't a boring legal manual that I could barely read if I weren't a lawyer. I wanted something that dealt with the sociological, the why is this happening? Who are the types of people based on what we know from research that I need to keep an eye out for? What's the best way to handle them? I didn't want something that was purely legal. I wanted something that was completely holistic, that would address it from, here's the sociological reason. This is why this person's head is operating this way and that they are taking this avenue. Hey, this is the business strategic way in which you handle this. This is also what research and the science says in dealing with this type of person. By the way, this is the mental health. This is the economic business for your future and your trajectory. And also, here's the way to move forward. I, I wanted it from pretty much A to Z on what to do. I, so I wrote it kind of like a Bible. So you can flip to a page and figure out, hey, okay, so in this situation, this is how I document so that if I ever have to go at it with my employer, that they won't question. They cannot question the strength of my recollection, my account of that situation. Thank you for that. I love this balance of the legal, but then also the sociological. So I hear you saying kind of the sociological is understanding what the framework, the mindset of someone who's going about doing this, engaging in sexual harassment. Can you say a little bit more about kind of what the mindset, the sociological components of it, of sexual harassment look like often? Uh, when it comes to the individual, I like to call them harassholes who perpetuate uh, sexual harassment in the workplace. Yeah. 
the thing is, is oftentimes uh, people will think of men and whatnot, but you really have to keep your eyes open everywhere. Because the thing is, is that sexual harassment is really a misnomer. That isn't what it is at all. It's, uh, it's again, it's trying to use gender constructs or beliefs about genders or sex and use it against someone in some way, whether you are coming on to them or whether you're putting them down. When people have a better understanding that it's mistreating, not sending a calendar invitation to the woman in the office who happens to be a lesbian because she's not heterosexual. It's these little things that go on where we are pigeonholing people based on our beliefs of gender or sex, and we're bullying them, we're treating them different. Now, whether it rises to a level of a legal level of view of a case, that's a whole different conversation. But when you can approach it from the sociological vantage point, that's when you are better positioned to understand why that's going on and what's behind it. And to get to your specific question of the type of person, generally when it comes to harassholes, you're looking for people who adhere to old school constructs about gender. You're looking for people also, there is a checklist basically that'll tell you the types of personalities you're working with. Because the thing is, we are all people and we're all individuals, snowflakes. We're great and unique, but we're really not when it comes to certain behaviors. We're all just human. And with that kind of mentioning of the similarities and the differences, when you were researching for the book, writing the book, and having conversations about the book as well, what have you learned about the similarities and differences about how you mentioned the misnomer of sexual harassment, which I hear you saying is sexualized and genderized bullying, how does that compare and contrast with other forms of bullying that might weaponize social difference? So for example, like maybe racialized bullying or bullying along the lines of disability status, how do those compare and contrast? The thing is they can definitely very much be intertwined, like the intersectional element, the fact that I am woman and I am black, that can play a role in how someone decides to come at me. Like research on sexual harassment shows that white women are more likely to receive put downs and black women and other women of color uh, because of hypersexualization are often more likely to receive come ons. So sexualized based harassment and bullying. And the thing is that intersectionality will also overlap to other areas. For example, if you are from a particular group or class, or if you have different ability, disability status, that might also impact how you are discriminated against, how you're treated different, how you're bullied and harassed. And it, it's incredibly unfortunate how it manifests. But the thing is, is people need to have a better understanding of what's going on. And especially the individuals who engage in these types of harassment, because sometimes people don't even necessarily realize what they're doing. But the thing is, we all need to be cognizant of it so that we can have a better work environment for all. And I love this inspiration to be more cognizant of a better work environment for all and how sexual harassment and workplace bullying compromises that. And that's kind of like your intention for the book. In having conversations about it afterwards and with your readers and people who've been inspired, who've been encouraged and empowered by the book. What conversations do you find yourself having most often? What do you feel has resonated with them the most? So you intended to put out some things. What do you find them receiving the most? Oh, well, I think when it comes to readers of staying in the game, people are most excited about knowing how to handle situations in strategic ways. Because the thing is, the law stuff, you leave that to lawyers. And most people think about law when they think about sexual harassment, they think about lawsuits and going public and all these things. And it starts way before then when it doesn't even necessarily into that terrain where it's all about how do I manage this person based on their personality type, based on what sociology says, and then also bringing in the strategy of workplaces and engaging with someone. And so people that I hear from the most who have read the book are very excited to now have those tools so they know what to say, they know what to do. A lot of our conversation is focused on perpetrators of sexual harassment and workplace bullying and the receivers of it. What advice do you have for third parties, for people who are intending to be allies? Maybe we'll start with, I am not a direct witness of this. So it's not like an instance is happening and I'm a bystander and I have an opportunity to intervene. 
but more so if someone that we know is going through this and processing this, what might be some valuable do's and don'ts for people to show support and to help people going through this? I think it's a matter of if that person is reaching out, if they're sharing, to be prepared to pretty much be there with them or be there to support them to the extent you can, because they're going to go through a host of different experiences and emotions. And oftentimes, we also want to bear in mind that our advice, the things we've heard, maybe even the things we've done, aren't necessarily helpful. You want to be fully informed on what can work best, what does work best. And that's also why I suggest people pick up the book, Staying in the Game, so you can understand the science. You can understand what is proven to work in terms of creating more inclusive space and environment, but also being a bystander. The fact is a lot of people don't recognize and don't know that you will suffer psychologically and likely also professionally at a point in time if you're in an environment that condones this behavior. And I love this idea of, like you were mentioning about listening and being prepared to receive and kind of follow their lead as opposed to, oh, this is advice that I heard from elsewhere. And really, I think what I'm trying to work on the most is listening to actually listen as opposed to philosophizing. Oh, what's the deeper question here? I'm trying to show support by going deeper as opposed to providing support by asking questions for clarification to just make sure to let the person know that I am making an effort to understand them. Mm -hmm. What are some other things that you find well-intended allies or interveners doing that might not be as helpful as they think it is? So for example, we're learning, hey, you're a professor by training. This is not the time to delve deep. Even if you're trying to demonstrate care and understanding, Maybe it's asking just questions of mirroring and am I understanding you correctly? What things do you other, see other people doing? We're like, no, stop doing that. I know you think that's good, but that's not as helpful. Well, things that I think can be extremely helpful are, you know, just the basic of would you like me to listen or are you looking for a response? Is this something you want to work through or just something that you're opening up uh, to get off your chest at this point in time? Seeing what that person actually needs from you in that moment. Uh, and also letting them know if you don't necessarily know right now, that's okay too. My initial response is X, Y, and Z, but stop me if that's not what you're looking for. Basically letting them drive the train. And then in addition to that, I think people can be the strongest in terms of their support and allyship when they appreciate that they don't have the answer. Mm -hmm. And it's okay to simply say, you know what? I've never been through this situation and I don't necessarily have the answer specifically for you. But what I can assure you is that I am here to support you. May I offer some resources or help you look into some that I know can get you to the next step? And recognizing again that they don't have all the answers and letting the people who do have the expertise be the guiding light. I love that. Taking a backseat, letting the person we're trying to serve and support be the guiding light. Adrian Lawrence, what lights are guiding you? What's interesting you now? What are your next and upcoming projects? Well, right now I have a weekly op-ed column that comes out in Straight Era News, and I'm very excited about that. That is every Wednesday. I have my opinion put out there, and you can also check out the commentary there weekly on san.com. That's www.san.com. Also, I continue to provide legal commentary for various outlets, as well as continuing to work with my clients. And I just started with a new class at USC, and I'm excited to work with these young minds. And are all of these lights converging and all the stars aligning for some major project that's all kind of coheres into one next book? Ah, uh, we will see. We will see. That's something I'm thinking about possibly for 2025. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I want to go a little bit broad again, because I know in anticipation of your visit, we had lots of questions about people being interested in like, hey, how can I help? How can I support? And there was lots of questions from people who are involved in the leadership of their ERGs, their employee resource groups or affinity groups. So you did a great job of helping us understand on the interpersonal level, it is me and one other person in a room having a conversation in real time. And also you talked about helping us with recognizing things in advance to create a 
culture and a climate of inclusivity that prevents these things from happening in the first place. But what about in that middle space where if I'm a leader involved with a ERG, how can those groups play a role in supporting individuals, especially through the reporting process? Uh, well, I think that ways in which that ERGs can support individuals is being mindful. If there is a larger issue going on in society to reach out to people because individuals are often impacted, whether they're fully cognizant of it or not. Because the thing is, people don't just check their identity at the door when they log on to work. They are bringing their whole selves. So being aware of what's going on in society and reaching out and letting people know, hey, you know, I know a lot can be going on right now and I want to let you know I'm here to support. If you'd like to come talk to us, any of the liaison or check out their network of resources. So being mindful of that and reaching out for the everyday. And then also opening your ERGs up and ensuring that everyone knows that they're welcome to join if they want to support, to uplift us allies, to learn more, to connect more. Because creating those avenues of connection is one of the important things about an ERG without necessarily saying you can only connect here if you have that certain particular identity. I love how throughout our conversation, you've mentioned kind of creating this environment, the climate that if we don't intervene, if we don't, like we almost make, we can help create an inclusive environment of belonging and psychological safety where these things don't happen in the first place. I love that idea. What advice would you have for everyday people who are at the workplace to help contribute to that climate that prevents these things as much as possible? I would say individuals work to try to be introspective, to not mm. assume that they can't be part of the problem, to not assume that they are absolved or innocent in some way, as opposed to being humble and recognize that we're all growing and things are ever changing. As I say to people, 60 years ago, you could have called me colored girl. You can't call me that today. And, you know, the color of my skin, if I were 60 or over, wouldn't have changed, but our society has changed. And so people who were slower in that change, it doesn't necessarily make them the bad guy. They just may be slower in that regard, or maybe they got the message a little later. But if we work together in recognizing that we're all growing and things are ever changing, then that's how we can truly be part of that change and hopefully not be late to the party when it comes to creating inclusivity. I love that being part of the change and being on time and even maybe even ahead of time for the party of creating inclusive change. So you've mentioned a little bit about the projects that you're working on, but how can our listeners continue to connect with you and to continue to grow and change and be part of the party? Well, you can find me on most social media outlets at Adrian Lawrence. And then also you can find me at Jennifer Brown Consulting. Uh, which is at www.jenniferbrownconsulting.com. And then as I mentioned, you can see my weekly Wednesday column come out at Straight Arrow News, which is www.san.com. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Adrian, for having this conversation with us and learning with us. Thank you so much. And we're so glad to all of you that you tuned into this week's episode of the Uplifting Impact podcast. And we need more people to help us uplift the impact. So in order to do so, please be sure to share this episode, comment on it by going to our website at upliftingimpact.com or provide your thoughts directly to us through LinkedIn at Uplifting Impact or Justin Ponder or Deanna Singh. And until next week, keep uplifting the impact.